Ready to go? Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I am Fiona Nikaneda. I'm the Executive Director of the Irish Penal Reform Trust, and I'm going to be your captain for this session this afternoon, uh, which considers the topic of facilitating the effective and equal participation of people with disabilities as it relates to prison. Uh, there's been strong interest in this particular session, and indeed, I don't know about everybody else, but certainly the, the perspectives and thoughts and ideas coming up this morning certainly have my all wheels turning. So we're looking forward to a good session now. So before I introduce our speakers, I'd just like to make a few uh, opening comments. Um, first of all, IPRT welcomes that the focus of the NDA co annual conference this year is on Article, thir uh, Article 13, especially considering the opportunities coming up with the first state report under the UNCRPD due and the current opportunities to positively influence policy in terms of the criminal justice sectoral strategy and also the youth justice strategy, along with what we consider to be really positive pro program for government commitments. So it's very encouraging that, and this conference we hope will inform the processes, um, but also will inform civil society and how we engage around the UN CRPD process. So just to identify where IPRT locates itself in this area. So our position is clear that Prison as a sanction should be a sanction as last resort for everyone, and this includes people with disabilities. However, for those people whose offending is so serious that prison is the only appropriate response, then it is clear that people with disabilities must have equal access uh, on the same basis as other prisoners to the physical environment, to services, regimes, and everything. So recognising the absolute lack of knowledge in this area, IPRT, supported by a, a grant award by the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, uh, we commissioned an in-depth research report from the National NUIG Centre for Disability Law and Policy, and I'm delighted that Maria will present their findings um, shortly. Um, I think it's important here to recognise the open engagement by the Irish Prison Service with this report. I mean, they facilitated voices across the system, um, many of which were very critical, not all, and that openness should be acknowledged. And also the engagement that we've had with the Irish Prison Service since then on the area of disability and moving towards making reasonable accommodation for people in prisons. It's safe to say they've a long way to travel, but the openness to letting the researchers in and the openness to engaging on the recommendations really should be acknowledged. Um, we also welcome that the um, Irish uh, Criminal and Civil Justice Disability Network are also engaging with the Irish Prison Service in terms of facilitating communications uh, or in terms of uh, facilitating awareness, uh, awareness training and provision. And also that the Irish Prison Service is listening to IPRT when we talk to them about how communications with families uh, for people with disabilities in prison must be improved and must be addressed during the, particularly during the challenging COVID-19 period. And also to recognise that the Inspector of Prisons too has picked up on the findings of our report um, and certainly the, the important aspects of the UNCRPD principles are reflected in the uh, framework for inspections of prisons in Ireland. So this is just to show that there is engagement on the state side which has to be recognised. IPRT remains concerned about the barriers and discrimination facing people with disability in prison. We are concerned, in particular, that people can be punished for disability-relating behaviours, and by this we mean behaviours perceived as challenging behaviour in the community and within the prisons themselves, which most often result from information or an environment that is inaccessible. The NUIG report also challenged our thinking around prison as a disabling environment and the need to make it fully accessible, particularly as it relates to mental health. IPRT will always be concerned that prison should never become the best or only place where a person can receive wraparound supports, however. So we're very interested in hearing the contributions for both Maggie and Gautam after Maria. So just some brief housekeeping before we go on. Uh, I'm told the captioning service will only begin from 2 p.m., but it will start at 2 p.m. Um, a reminder to our speakers to please keep their mics off when they're not speaking. <laughs> 
And um, this session is all about conversation. So please can everybody do add questions and comments in, in the box and they will be moderated and facilitated at the end. Uh, for reasons of time, I'm only going to give the titles of the speakers, but the full bio, uh, full biographies are in the document, but it's, it's uh, just to apologize to the speakers for the brevity. I'm going to be militaristic about timekeeping, so that's a heads up, and that's in order to facilitate a really good and I hope in-depth Q&A following these uh, presentations. Okay, so first I'd like to introduce Maria Nicolaherta, who is Research Assistant with the Centre for Disability Law and Policy at NUIG, and she is going to be speaking on the topic of the rights of people with disabilities in Irish prisons. You're very welcome, Maria. Uh, thanks, Vienna. Uh, if we could go to the slides, please, um, to the first slide. Um, so we're going to be talking today about the rights of disabled people in Irish prisons. And as Fiona has already spoken about, this is on the back of a significant um, report that I was privileged to be able to work as part of a team on that. Um, uh, and it's, it's basically a whistle stop tour of that report. Uh, and I will try and keep it as brief as possible in order to facilitate good discussion. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, so a background to the report and a background, I suppose, framework for what we're discussing here. We very much used a human rights conception of disability within the entire report. And when we look at the report and who we're talking about here, we're using that, uh, I suppose, conception of disability that comes from the CRPD, which is uh, on the slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so we use that human rights framework um, uh, in order to, I suppose, identify participants, but also it, it formed the basis, the, the, the basis of the report. Um, so ultimately, while it can seem like there's a lot of emptiness around where disabled people rights in prison are on the rights of people with disabilities in prison, that's not necessarily the most clearly laid out area of international human rights law or even domestic law. So there are quite a number of obligations on the state from general human rights treaties which apply to disabled people, including UDHR, the ECHR, the ICCPR, uh, UNCAT. Um, we also have to acknowledge the prisoner rights framework and the Mandela rules and the disability rights framework uh, uh, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, specifically focusing on things like equality and non-discrimination, accessibility and reasonable accommodation. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, there's other, there's, this is also an issue that has been, I suppose, litigated at a European level, um, uh, particularly under Article 3 of the European Court of Human, or the European Convention of Human Rights, in the European Court of Human Rights, um, looking at prohibition of torture and uh, cruel and unusual punishment. And there's a number of cases that have come in front of the court in order to recognise that actually people with disabilities who are in prison have rights and that those rights, rights need to be respected and states are failing in that in a lot of regards. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so again, this is situated in uh, the Irish Prison Service and this report looked at the Irish Prison Service and as Fiona has already mentioned, we were blessed really with the engagement that we got both from people working within the prison service alongside the prison service, but also from people in prisons themselves. And I'll talk a little bit about that before in, in, in a moment. Um, so the prison population in Ireland is um, comparatively small to, to, to some states, it's, or it looks small because we're a small island. So there's uh, less than 5,000 people in prison. Uh, again, a lot of these are sentences of less than one year. Um, uh, the prisons are governed by the 2007 Act, which uh, give effect to the statutory instrument on the prison of the prison rules, uh, and these are broadly rooted in the Mandela standards. And now these do the, these rules do foresee the specific transfer of people with disabilities to like forensic psychiatric psychiatric settings. Um, uh, one of the th quotes that we got from someone working within the prison service, which really um, uh, uh, this still sticks with me uh, a, a year after writing the report nearly, um, is that one of the big issues for, with Maria, prison... just interrupt you, and um, there's a request if you could just uh, slow down so that people can keep up. No. I will try and balance both time responses and speaking clearly. Don't worry, I'll give you an extra couple of minutes to... <laughs> um, uh, but the idea that came from this particular person with working within prisons and working within the justice system was that if you weren't um, 18 to 30, able-bodied and male, that that, 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 that that prison wasn't built for you and it would be a challenge for you. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Uh, so over the course of the project, we were really lucky with the access we got. Um, uh, one, we were particularly um, lucky with, uh, we had five disabled persons organizations that acted as, I suppose, a guide and structured the project um, and, and, and provided invaluable um, resources there. Um, we were also able to interview, carry out over 31 interviews in a relatively short space of time, including with 16 disabled people in prison, which we were quite worried about, uh, quite worried about. But again, there was a lot of cooperation there. Um, uh, so we had, uh, so we interviewed 16 disabled people, four prison staff, three disability rights advocates, one penal reform advocate, and then seven stakeholders who really I suppose crossed a whole a whole variety of roles within the justice system. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, and what we came back with in terms of the prison um, report was uh, a number of different barriers that were at, at, at I suppose all levels of of, of prison, um, and that a lot of the barriers that disabled people face in day to day life were um, very much magnified in a prison setting. So the physical environment was an issue across impairment types. And I know that as I am, who uh, are, are here today have done some, some work on this and the National Autistic Society in the UK have also done a huge amount of work on this. But within neurodivergent prisoners in particular, um, not only was built environment a really significant problem, which it is, even if buildings are up to like M standards, they're not completely accessible or as accessible as someone's, I suppose, um, main place of residence would need to be, the actual sensory environment of prisons proved really, really, really challenging. Um, uh, and we found, I suppose, from speaking to people within the prisons themselves, that they were both kind of experiencing over and under stimulation. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, a significant issue that came out right through was access to information. Um, a huge amount of information is written down. Uh, and while prisons are generally quite well versed in plain language, um, easy read, and I suppose more, um, I, I, I don't particularly like the word, more complex forms of written communication or, 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 or um, accessible co confirmation or accessible communication weren't there. Um, uh, and that caused issues um, right through people's experience in prison that they didn't, they often didn't have that very basic information. And this is a problem beyond disability within the prison service, but it, um, it's been significant. And again, I can remember specifically sitting in that one interview where someone uh, highlighted that they tried to make up their own meaning of whatever was in front of them because they weren't sure and it wasn't being communicated to them effectively. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, uh, again, this leads to also verbal communication uh, being a significant issue. Um, uh, and this both created barriers in terms of people being able to, um, I suppose, function within a prison and navigate a prison setting. Um, but it also really caused some problems in terms of uh, exacerbating tensions uh, and that like miscommunications often, often led to, I suppose, incidences or, or tensions, particularly with prison officers. Um, and this was acknowledged on, on both sides. And there's a quote here from one of the, I'm trying to keep the, I suppose, share as much of what we were told by the people themselves in this. Um, uh, uh, but even just simply understanding this for this particular um, person, understanding that they needed things to be repeated again and again and again, and that they needed that consistent communication, just that understanding wasn't there and that caused significant difficulties for them. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, and uh, again, this is just another, um, I suppose, quote, uh, highlighting, highlighting that and, and I suppose highlighting the extent of the, like, uh, the aggravation that can occur if different forms of communication aren't facilitated or recognised. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so we also, again, we used a human rights framework for the project. Um, there was very minimal understanding of rights. Like, I think one of the things from, I suppose, coming from, like, a, a, a legal background myself, uh, people not understanding themselves as rights holders once they were within the prison setting was quite upsetting. And there was quite a lot of confusion between rights and regime. Um, uh, and, you know, books that, 
express prison rules, but didn't necessarily, you know, define that you are like you, you are entitled to other rights beyond just rules and regime. That understanding wasn't there. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, uh, the rules themselves also presented a significant issue and the regime, regime system uh, within the prisons caused uh, significant problems for people with disabilities in prison settings. Um, so like one, how rules were communicated and now different, uh, different prisons did have different approaches to communicating, I suppose, rules and regime and, and things around disciplinary. Um, uh, but uh, as you can see from the quotes from the uh, interviewees, um, uh, there wasn't, uh, most people we spoke to didn't feel it was being communicated to them effectively. Um, we used easy read, obviously, uh, we had easy read consent forms available. And uh, one particularly striking memory that comes out is someone pointing to it being like, I need that. That is what I need my rules to be written on. Um, uh, and being really clear that like an accessible information on uh, accessible information on prison rules would, would, would be uh, really impactful for people's experience. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so the regime itself, again, as I've, I've, I've sort of alluded to, created uh, significant issues. Irish prisons operate on an incentivized regime, uh, which means that your, I suppose, not your rights, but your privileges are dependent on where you fall in this regime. But these things are often judged on your behavior or your ability to participate in a program which isn't accessible to everyone. So um, one thing uh, that came quite, that one thing that was very confused about what they needed to do in order to be able to, um, I suppose, uh, access that regime and, you know, the next slide please um, uh, one of the um, was like the prison report there as it was but from a um from a um a person in prison perspective um it was that the systems that were there were just inaccessible and, and, and weren't um weren't 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 fit for purpose if you had a disability next slide please um uh employment was also a big thing and uh, right across pretty much everyone we interviewed mentioned employment and very few people actually had access to i suppose employment in a prison setting everyone wanted it uh in some cases it was very clear that people were told that you were not getting a job because you have a disability but in other settings it it it, 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 it wasn't quite so clear that that's what people were experiencing but it was um something that was raised kind of consistently throughout um uh, uh, and people kind of being, I suppose, bobbed off on it consistently over over years in some cases. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another striking aspect of the of the report is that um, uh, where people got support within uh, within prisons and prisoners relying on other people in the prison, other, relying on other prisoners specifically for support in informal bases. Um, you know, we heard of people having other prisoners transcribe lessons so people could go to school or um, uh, or, or provide actually rather significant like um, 
uh, I suppose, health, like sanitation support in a couple of inc 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 incidents um, and, 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 and really being as a, that, that being a, 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 a significant form of support. Um, and then also that like um, uh, prison officers themselves were also providing support, but there were instances where let's say people, uh, if a inmate asked for support, um, like people were told things like, oh, we're not insured. So that was very much, it depended on who you were in contact with. Uh, Sorry, Maria, I'd say another minute, please. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, so diversion was also an issue um, that that came up and it was a particular concern among stakeholders that like diversion to forensic settings or to non uh, non prison settings or um, I suppose disability specific settings um, could create massive access to justice issues. Um, uh, and particularly given the risk of having a sentence extended through wardship or through the Mental Health Act. Um, uh, and the access to justice issues that in itself creates. Um, and uh, so that was one issue that, that I suppose and one tension that was kind of quite clear in the report then. Um, and then last two slides, please. Um, the final point I'll bring up is um, there were significant issues around transition from prison that actually people with disabilities ended up spending more time in prison, or at least that was anecdotally what, what we were hearing, partly because things like parole was an issue people were want people were being perceived as more of a risk that systems like community and temporary release weren't actually accessible a lot of the time you had to work a physical job in order to engage with some of these things um, if you wanted to go to a step down facility a lot of the time the medical supports you'd need wouldn't be there um, so that's a uh, 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 or, or, or various schemes just 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 weren't in place and weren't accessible, which uh, extended people's overall um, uh, time in prison and significantly damaged their experience. So that's kind of a whistle stop tour of uh, some of the things and some of the issues that were raised. I'm going to leave it there, um, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to have a chat about that in the discussion. Thank you so much, Maria. There is just so much to get in, and and just to um the just to remind everyone that the report itself is invaluable. Everyone should read it. The most important thing is it includes the voices of people with experience themselves, and that it was also informed by an advisory group made up of people with experience. And um, so this is anyway, it's it's in the the conference uh, resources list. So you can access it um now. Um, I, just a couple of uh, th quick thoughts and reflections. One thing is, I suppose we should all um, be mindful of the intersectional discrimination that happens, you know, where people have, as Maria outlined, more than one form of disability, but also one, more than one form of discrimination. An example is you can have a member of the traveling community who is also female, who also has disabilities and maybe more short term mental health issues. So, you know, it's, it's complex and it's jo not just looking at one form of discrimination at a time. No more should we look at one form of disability at a time. Um, also, just, um, just a point on diversion that comes up. I mean, of course, this just kind of recalls what I was saying at the outset. It's so important that we provide equal and effective access in prisons, but we also have to ensure that appropriate alternatives exist in the community. And I think the Q&A was likely to bring up uh, that, that topic. Lots to discuss there. So thanks so much, Maria. We're just, we're going to move on now to the next speaker. We're going to do it small shift in the program. So the next speaker is Professor Gautam Galati. Uh, Gautam is consultant psychiatrist and adjunct associate clinical professor at University of Limerick and he's going to speak to us on the topic of intellectual disabilities in Irish prisons. Could article 13 hold the key? Thanks Gautam. I think you're not on mute. Uh, you need to unmute. Thank you very much, Fiona, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the National Disability Authority for inviting me to speak today. Uh, over the next few minutes, um, I'm going to talk about four published papers in respect of people with intellectual disabilities in Irish prisons and bring the discussion to Article 13 and in particular Article 13.2 of um, the UNCRPT. Uh, this work has been done predominantly with uh, Professor Shane Kilcommons, uh, 
and Dr. Alan Cusack at UL, as well as Professor Brendan Kelly at Trinity, and particular thanks to Professor Colm Dunn at the School of Medicine. Could I have the first slide, please? The first study uh, is a systematic review looking at evidence about the prevalence of people with intellectual disabilities in Irish prisons. The findings of this review, this is published in the International Journal of Prisoner Health, if anyone wants to look at the full text. The findings were striking. The first finding was that there's very little contemporary data in terms of how many people there are with intellectual disabilities in Irish prisons. The data that does exist is, is even more concerning, which is that the most robust study was about 20 years ago, and that would suggest that nearly one in three people in, our, in the Irish prison system uh, are people with an intellectual disability. This is a significant overrepresentation as, as compared to community estimates. And this, this concern is shared by other, other jurisdictions and other countries have reported similar elevated prevalences. Uh, these are countries such as the US, the UK, Norway, Spain, and others. We might go to the next slide, please. The, the, the pathway, the criminal justice pathway, the journey of a prisoner always begins with arrest and custody. And that is going to be the focus of my next paper, which, which sought to evaluate the experiences of people with intellectual disabilities encountering police officers as the suspects of crime. To do this, we looked at several published medicine and law databases. And we found seven studies, uh, largely from the UK, Canada, and Australia, which brought together voice, brought together the voice of 1,200 people nearly, nearly 1,200 people with intellectual disabilities. And I guess at the outset, I must say, there's very little published data out there. Uh, you know, just seven studies in this field, which I think is really important. But people with intellectual disabilities often describe feeling frightened, confused, and isolated whilst in police custody. Our study found that they, they describe challenges understanding information, communicating information. They describe a paucity of supports, both practical supports, as well as emotional supports in police custody. And even in jurisdictions like, like England and Wales, where there is an appropriate adult system, people with intellectual disabilities say that often they don't understand the role of the appropriate adult and that the appropriate adult is provided in quite an inconsistent uh, way. Uh, in fact, there were studies out there which said that the majority of, of interactions didn't involve appropriate adults. People with intellectual disabilities also describe difficulties accessing and following legal advice. For example, one included study said, uh, the, the, the participants said that they were given access to a lawyer across the phone and all the lawyer said to them was answer no comment to any question you're asked. And they found this very difficult to follow to the police interview. Can I have the next slide, please? Which brings me on to my next study, which was a similar review looking at the experience of law enforcement officers, that's police officers interfacing with suspects who have an intellectual disability. In this review, we found 16 studies. These, these were from five countries, uh, which were the UK, US, Canada, Norway, and Australia. Uh, and these incorporated the views of nearly a thousand police officers of all ranks. And we included police officers both on the beat as well as police custody officers. Across the board, police officers identify a need for awareness and training. And they say they need this because they have great difficulty identifying people with intellectual disabilities when they interface with, with people in the community. They say they can't identify those who need additional supports. They're very much aware of the need to put in additional practical supports, um, but they, 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 they identify that it's difficult to, to know who to provide these supports to. They describe a tension. The police officers say, well, our role is, is, to, to, is to investigate and prosecute a crime in, in the most effective manner. 
but at the same time, they're very much aware that the forensic accuracy is also dependent on providing the appropriate safeguards to people who need these. One study included looked at the notice of rights in, in England and uh, tried to propose a format of a notice of rights in, in a type of easy read format. Uh, but this was one jurisdiction and, and you know, I, I, I'm certainly of the view this needs to be done more in other jurisdictions as well. Can I have the next slide, please? The next paper looks at, looks at the whole concern around the high prevalence of intellectual disabilities in Irish prisons. What can be done to reduce this? As Fiona said in her opening statement, really, prison should be a place of last resort at the time of sentencing for everybody, not just people with disabilities. But I must say that, that, that it's a really challenging place for people with intellectual disabilities to be. In my view, diversion services that exist in Ireland are prim primarily focused on severe mental illness. And the screening, screening programs that exist are limited to Dublin prisons and again focus on severe mental illness. Therefore, if we need to impact the prevalence of people with intellectual disabilities in Irish prisons, we have to look earlier on in the criminal justice pathway. And in my view, the answer lies in intervening at the arrest and police custody stage. That's where work needs to be done to, to, to ensure the rights of people with intellectual disabilities are, are respected um, and their participation in the process is fully respected. Next slide, please. So in summary, there's little contemporary data, but the data we do have paints a concerning picture about the prevalence of people with intellectual disabilities in Irish prisons. But looking at the start of the criminal justice pathway, people with disabilities, intellectual disabilities, find this a very challenging place, feeling frightened, confused, isolated, and describing difficulties accessing practical and emotional supports at arrest and police custody. Police officers recognize this, but feel they don't have adequate training, the adequate tools to identify people who need support, as, as well as the, the, the right skills to provide these supports. I think Ireland's ratification of the CRPD is timely. It provides the correct momentum for us to work further in this area. But in particular, Article 13.2, which talks about the state providing training for law enforcement of officials, I think is particularly key to trying to address the issue of prevalence of people with intellectual disabilities in Irish prisons. Thank you very much. Fiona, I'll hand back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gautam. Thank you for your excellent timekeeping, which is certainly uh, 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 certainly will keep us all to time and um, that was really interesting I think um, I think what's really important here which I bring up and which you articulated so well is just the pathways and the multiple points for positive intervention and diversion and that we have to look at an earlier stage in this and um, it's also very interesting how strong you brought in the perspectives of staff and also the needs for awareness and training. So this, that was one of the core findings of um, the NUIG research, which Maria presented on, but also the importance of that is peer-led training. And of course, almost every report commissioned by IPRT come back, comes back to data, 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 the absence of it and the importance of it. So thank you so much, Gautam. That's really great contribution and lots to come back to in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll just move on now to, um, to introduce our final of the three speakers. So Dr. Mag Maggie McGovern is senior psychologist in the DOCA Center in Mountjoy Prison. Um, she will be speaking on the topic of towards trauma responsive custody supporting mental health. And it's a, certainly trauma has come up a lot of times on Twitter and also in the contributions of the speakers this morning. So this is timely. Thanks, Maggie. you're on mute. 
Thank you. I'm just saying I'm delighted to be here. I was having some technical difficulties there and thank you to Bhutan for switching with me. Um, today I'm here to speak a little bit about supporting people with mental health difficulties in custody and to give a little bit of an indication of the direction of travel of the IPS psychology service at the moment. Um, as we're all aware, mental health can represent a disability and also there are I suppose many people in custody who present with disabilities of various forms. Um, to begin with, um, it's important that I say a little bit about what we mean by mental health. And so next slide, please, Jason, if that's OK. And um, we are referring to mental health as occurring along a spectrum. From healthy to coping with struggle, coping with difficulties, to struggling, to then veering into being unwell and our role in the prison services to support people to maintain their mental health as well as possible um, and to preclude people from entering into that unwell zone um, in so far as possible and support them in regards to that. Um, next slide. The jury's absolutely in. We're very aware that mental health difficulties are at a much higher rate in custody than what they are in the general public. Not just mental health difficulties, but learning and communication difficulties and addiction problems. We are in prisons internationally responding to an environment where people are presenting not just with a high level of mental health difficulties, but also to a high level of comorbid presentations. So that's when people are presenting with mental health diagnoses that are two or more, so two concurrent uh, diagnoses. That raises the level of complexity in terms of assessment and also of treatment and support. In addition to comorbid mental health presentations, people in custody have the additional struggle of several other concurrent vulnerabilities. And these are listed here. The kinds of difficulties that are physical or psychosocial that make it very difficult to support mental health. These include unstable housing, financial difficulties, poor general health, trauma, life and social skills that are more limited relative to peers, addiction and problematic drug use or alcohol abuse, learning difficulties and disabilities, a history of unemployment and limited education. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll see a little of the findings from a very large UK study. It's 1998, so a little outdated, but there's nothing to suggest that these rates will have changed any. This study involved 3000 interviews with males in custody. And of those, 90% were suffering from a mental illness, addiction or personality disorder. And on the ground, that feels very reflective of the cohort in our prisons. 70% of those had two or more such problems. And so the level of complexity again reiterated. Given some special consideration then to rates of personality disorder among the um, population in custody, if you or I to, were to walk around our, our Tesco to pick up milk and uh, bread, we would find that between 4 and 11% of those around us um, are presenting with a personality disorder. If you were to walk across the campus in Mount Joy, you would be expecting about 60 to 70% of people that you pass to be presenting with a personality disorder. It's a very, very stark differential in the percentages there. It's not a diagnosis that anybody would want. Um, and I mean, all mental health difficulties are things that would rather be avoided. But this one in particular has a history of being seen as untreatable, as ingrained in the personality of the individual and unlikely to change with intervention. Um, even within our own legislation, this is a diagnosis of exclusion where the Republic of Ireland Mental Health Act does not recognize personality disorder within its powers. Additionally, personality disorders are very strongly associated with trauma. Um, this is a diagnosis where trauma is part of the etiology of the, of the disorder, part of the development of the disorder. And um, we'll have a little bit more to say about trauma, as you'll imagine in the next slide. Thanks, Jason. Just the next slide, yeah, thank you. 
where in responding to the complexities of each individual's comorbid presentations and in recognizing the unique constellation of strengths and needs that each individual brings, um, it behoves the, the services in the prison to respond to each person on an individualized basis so that each individual is having a health and care needs assessment that's tailored to their unique presentation and that assessment and management of those needs are on an individualized basis and that is challenging in a prison environment but absolutely necessary. So in responding to that constellation of unique needs it's very important that while seeing the individual we don't miss the wood for the trees um, you wouldn't need to be in um, a prison environment long. Indeed, you wouldn't need to be a psychologist or a mental health professional to very quickly ascertain that the people in custody have lives characterised by trauma and adversity. These are lives that have been difficult and often difficult from the outset. So if we move to the next slide, we'll see that the bigger picture is that people in custody have experiences of adverse childhood experiences that are much higher than the general population rates of these difficulties or these experiences. So this slide here um, shows the findings of a large Welsh study of last year with 468 Welsh um, men in custody identifying rates of childhood maltreatment, as you'll see in the box on the left there, and rates of household um, adversities as represented in the box on the right. These are very high rates and exceed um, the typical rates in the community. If we move to the next slide then, we'll see that these difficulties are even more pronounced in the female population in custody. Um, coming to just physical and sexual violence alone, we can see that up to 90%, depending on the research, of women in custody have experienced physical or sexual violence, and that's a very um, impacting uh, level. ACEs, and for anybody who's uninitiated in the ACEs field, please look at the TED Talk. That's a good place to start. Then the, the research here by Filetti, 1998, what that research identified is that exposure to adverse childhood experiences goes hand in hand with a whole range of adverse adult outcomes. These include risk of poor health, mental illness, early development of chronic health conditions, premature mortality, addiction, poor educational attainment, and engaging, engaging in violence and crime. So to slow it down a little bit, we'll see that for those people who had four or more adverse childhood experiences in childhood, those people were 15 times more likely to have perpetrated violence in the last year, and they were 20 times more likely to be incarcerated. So this, that is again going back to the research in Wales in that prison um, and showing that there is a dosage effect here between adversity and these risks. We know that um, it, people with intellectual disabilities are overrepresented in the prison population but also their exposure to adversity is also higher when compared to peers without such disabilities. What we're seeing here is a picture that is not a prison problem per se, but a public health difficulty, a public health problem. Um, and if we move to the next slide, we'll see some of what we see um, as regards the interrelationships between trauma and these variety of impacted areas and outcomes. We're not sure how this me these mechanisms are translated. What we know is that there is a very strong correlation between exposure to trauma and negative impacts. The method by which that, that is translated is up for research. There have been lots of interesting findings across many fields. Um, the fields of neurobiology and epigenetics in particular, we can see that um, trauma seems to be this type of stress that increases risk across all of these domains. Um, there is new research to suggest that it is in fact trauma that is activating um, particular genes for violence and that when those genes are activated through trauma, the, the likelihood of a violent, um, violent behaviour increases. 
But where people with those genes do not have exposure to trauma, the likelihood of them engaging in violent behavior is actually much lower than people who do not have that genetic profile. So as I say, we don't know the exact mechanisms by which all of this occurs, but we do know that prisons are populated by people with a very high level of trauma and childhood adversity. So if we move to the next slide, please. It's fair to say that many in custody benefit from basic care, from provision of safety, of a safe place to sleep, of regular meals, of healthcare and specialist interventions. And while all of that is true, it is also very apparent that there is a large risk of re-traumatization for people in custody. There is every opportunity for an exacerbation of mental health difficulties. Prison is a uniquely challenging environment. Uh, research is continually showing across Europe that the complexity of the prison environments are increasing. There's a wide vulnerability to humiliation and violence and overcrowding heightens all of this. The atmosphere tends to be one of suspicion as opposed to one of safety and trust. Um, and while the IPS tries and strives very hard to present um, an environment to the person in custody that is safe and that feels safe, it is difficult for somebody with a history of trauma to relax into that and to trust it. And a certain amount of wariness is healthy in that context. We're very clear that imprisonment of people with severe disabilities and in health is inappropriate. And there is a lot of work every day in prisons across the country to divert people to more suitable places of care. Um, coordination with community and specialist services is part of work. what works well, but as Gutam and others uh, will have attested to, we need much more of that. If we move then to the next slide. Thank you. People who've survived um, childhoods of, of trauma often develop coping strategies that were useful at the time of the trauma and which often in adulthood no longer serve and which generate new difficulties. And so, for example, it may be that somebody will engage in risky sexual behavior as a means of feeling a sense of love or belonging and that that is actually causing more difficulties. It may be that somebody is engaging in violent behavior as a means of showing worthiness or of having other needs met. Um, and so what we are supporting people to do is to try and learn new strategies, try something different. And this is very difficult when you're on high alert, when you don't feel safe. And we need prisons to be places where people can feel safe in order that they might practice and learn new skills. We don't want trauma to be something that defines a person negatively or limits their future. Um, and it need not be that, but we would need prisons to become a place where people feel safe to try new ways of coping. So if we move to the next slide, what we need is a, a trauma-informed system. And these are um, the characteristics of the kind of system that we're looking for. One that realizes the widespread impact of trauma, one that recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma and one that responds by fully integrating the knowledge into practice, actively seeking to resist re-traumatization, which is the biggest risk, I think, in the custodial environment. Prisons are a tricky place to implement this kind of um, intervention. If we move to the next slide, we'll just give a brief summary of some of the trauma specific supports that are already available to people in custody. And they include services like our own in the psychology service and others. What we need is a learning environment that is also trauma informed, one that imbues a sense of safety, predictability and calm. Not exactly the images that often come up for people when they imagine the prison environment, but this is achievable and can be done. Um, and every day we're, we're working to progressing towards that. If we move to the next slide, we'll see the six principles that underpin a trauma-informed approach. Safety, trustworthiness, transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality empowerment of voice and choice that one cannot be emphasized enough and one that gives recognition to cultural historical and gender issues 
these principles are lovely who's against any of these things i mean that who would be they they are it just intrinsically sound worthwhile to all of us that they are very challenging to implement and in jurisdictions where others are ahead of where we're at there have been very very many challenges in implementing this kind of approach um I've been flagging there the work of Yvonne Jukes and others last year in highlighting what are the difficulties in making this meaningful? What is it about prisons that mean that there's a risk that we engage in what could be tokenism around a trauma-informed approach and not engage in that in a meaningful way? If we move to the next slide then. I'm just flagging here some of the um, psychology services strategic actions for 2019 to 2022. These are many of them based on an independent assessment completed by Frank Poporino in 2015 of our service. And he identified a need to develop a best fit model of trauma informed correctional care in the Irish prison service and um, put that within the, the, the reach and grasp of the psychology service. As it stands, the ratio of psychologists to people in custody um, at the moment is far um, in excess of what the recommended um, allowance is, or maybe I should say far less than the, the recommended ratios should be. So at the moment, we have one psychologist to 315 people in custody, and the recommended number would be one psychologist to 150 people in custody. And those um, ratios are taken from the end of December 2019. So we're going in this direction. We're picking up speed and pace. Recruit prison officers are now trained um, to, and learning a lot more about trauma as part of uh, their qualifications. What we want is, I suppose, to progress this further so that it becomes more meaningful and integrated in day-to-day -day care. So I'll finish there. I'm conscious I'm a little over time, Fiona. <laughs> Um, I've left some um, references and resources at the end for anybody who's interested in hearing a little bit more or learning a bit more about this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie. Gautam was so efficient. He was so time efficient. It was no problem at all. And thank you so much for addressing in such depth the, the question of, um, of whether trauma-informed care, whether and how trauma-informed care can be provided in a, in a prison system. I mean, you've presented what sounds like really responsive to people's needs, and we certainly welcome that. You can't get away that prison as a structure is certainly, you know, culture of control, power differential, lack of agency and choice, you know, you can't decide whether you have a shower today, you can't decide when you're going to eat today. So, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges that are just built into the very fabric of imprisonment, but it's certainly great to hear about the opportunities for change. And as you said yourself, it's a tricky place, but that you're going to go beyond tokenism. Um, you know, we, we're also mindful that um, the last sentence, census, prison sentence, census showed us that 14% of the prison uh, population was locked up for 19 or more hours a day. And more than 350 of those were locked up for more than 21 hours a day. And that's before the COVID-19 pandemic arrived on these shores. So there are certainly so many challenges, but thank you, Maggie. You've really, you've given me heart anyway, <laughs> in, in so far as, and in so far as is possible. Thanks also. I think you might have um, answered the question of uh, the first question, which was from Jane Mulcahy. So I'll just ask Jane if it wasn't adequately answered. So she asked about the prevalence of childhood trauma and adversity among prisoners with ID in Irish prisons. Um, but I think you answered that. So Jane, if, if you, it was insufficient if you let us know through the chat box. I just want to note that Jane also talked about research um, that identified the, the, the links between risk accumulation and intellectual development. And she just showed the, the impact. So that with an absence of any risk factor, the average verbal IQ scores among four-year-olds was 119. And she goes through, and as you accumulate uh, with four, up to four risk factors, the score is reduced to 93. And accumulation of eight risk factors resulted in IQ verbal IQ score of 85. So a lot of this is quite devastating, but we need to we need to treat them as not predictive, but as opportunities for change much earlier on in social policy change. So thanks, thank you, Maggie. Thank I you. wonder if I can invite, can all the speakers come back on um, and we can put forward some of the questions that have been asked? <laughs> 
I'll zoom ahead. I'll certainly the first one, maybe it's only one at a time that, oh, great, you know. Okay, so first question, Maria, it's a question for you, which is what further research would you recommend in the context of prisons, mental health uh, and mental health in prisons by way of a follow up to your research report? And that comes from Cormac McCarthy. Um, so a lot, uh, and I think our conversations around the time that the report was published were, were, were that we need to do more, more research in this area. And there's a few areas that have really been uh, that that really deserve more research that we weren't able to touch on effectively. One, you talked about people who were like effectively locked up for more than 19 hours a day or 20 hours a day or were in solitary confinement. They were populations we very much weren't able to reach within the um, prison service uh, for obvious logistical reasons. But I think actually an opportunity to, to engage with those populations in particular would be really, really welcome. And that research would be really, really valuable. Alongside that, I think a long term study like we ultimately did this. We got into we, we actually started uh, interviews in summer for a report that was or by the time we got into the actual prison settings for a report that was published in January this year, although that seems unbelievable. It's definitely <laughs> four years ago. Um, uh, I think a, a, a very a long term extended study is really, um, really would be called for here and would be worthwhile. Um, but yeah, so people who are in more secure settings within prisons um, and a long term study. I'd also particularly actually on the diversion thing, I would like I, I would really like the opportunity to, I suppose, um, research uh, on that particular area because again a lot of it gets missed and I should also say that Guatam and some of the quant stuff that comes out is also quite crucial um, and, and we need more quantitative as well as the qualitative thing but I think it has to be a combination of both. Thanks Maria yeah I think we always arrive at that that we're very clear on the need for diversion but perhaps we're less clear on where people should be diverted to but certainly the, la the need for investment in that area is clear. And we do hope that the, the cross-agency, cross-departmental task force on mental health, imprisonment and addictions will sort of lead away of the, that sort of joined up thinking piece, which we can then apply in other areas. So there's a bit of, bit of hope there. Um, to ask, this is a question for all, all speakers and for, again from Cormac, but it's, it's quite a big question. Uh, but a good question, which is how best do we address intersecting issues within the prison system? For example, travelers with disabilities and migrants with mental health issues. And I would just say my own pitch on that is that what we find is taking the example of people with disabilities, what's good for people with disabilities is good for everyone else as well. For example, the provision of easy, easy to read uh, information on rights in prison is good for everyone, not only those with disabilities, because there are people who, you know, high rates of literacy issues, for example. So that's my spake on it. Um, I'm wondering if Maggie, you or Nadine, would you have any idea, particularly as you're working in the DOCA Centre where you must see this every day? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great question because this is part of the challenge is that those comorbidities and that constellation of vulnerabilities can traverse huge areas that are really quite specialist in nature. And there's something I think about the prison walls that means sometimes national, national specialist services are reluctant to cross the walls into custody to reach out across services. Um, and there's a risk as well of prisons becoming siloed and services and prisons being separate from um, community based services. So I think the solution to that, or part of the solution, is the development of good multidisciplinary links, both within and across um, the system, um, and a lot more. And I mean, credit to the NDA for a conference like today, which is an opportunity for people from various backgrounds and sectors to come together. Um, the prison never, ever fails to present unique constellations of um, difficulties and strength among the cohort that we have and there's always um scope for doing more in terms of bringing together services to provide what an individual needs and um, often that those services might be outside of the prison environment thank you so much maggie that's really clear would anybody else like to come in on that or will i move to another question okay, if you raise your hand, Maria. 
Yeah, I think also like a lot of the time when, and again, you briefly touched on this, some of the issues that we're looking at, even just in terms of trauma is so structural um, and that these themselves are the issues that, 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 that tend to magnify these forms of discrimination and this intersecting form of discrimination. And I think, you know, we've touched on women and travelers and people with disabilities and people who, you know, meet, who, who fit in that across those identities. Um, but that while we can do very specific, like while we can do things that are very good for disabled people, um, that's most going to benefit the more middle class men. Uh, not that there's that many of them in uh, in 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 in, pri in prison. Whereas in order to actually really get to the root of that, we have to start challenging those structural things uh, that I suppose also are what makes prison more traumatic as well. But like really, uh, that's. I think the only way we'll resolve it and I'm asking that question outside of prison all of the time as well um but uh, yeah so that's that's for me would be it I'd just like to echo what Margaret said there um and and you know as a as someone working in the prison system um when you come across uh, someone in practice it's it's often someone with multiple adversities typically it'd be someone with a severe mental illness who also has has difficulties with addiction issues might have a degree of intellectual disability uh and uh, more often than not, is, is also homeless at the point they come in. So it's about developing an individualized approach uh, to the person uh, you're interfacing with whilst, whilst uh, you know, trying to see how you can help them best. But there's societal issues, and, and I think a lot needs to be done to address issues before people are in prison. And, and Fia, Fia and I keep coming back to your point, which is prison needs to be the last uh, uh, last place, uh, 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 the, the last option in terms of sentencing, and, and that's where uh, the answer lies. Thanks so much, Gautam. Um, I'm just going to seek Kieran's permission to ask one last question because we all do need to be somewhere else at 3 p.m. But just there's another a question that brought in a different angle, which was what part does education in prisons play in supporting mental health and what needs to happen to ensure that education in prison meets prisoners' needs um, better? Um, yeah, that's the last one. Well, if anyone has some some uh, uh, question, we need to finish actually. So I will just answer that question by saying education plays a very important uh, role in it. And we know we we know, for example, in the DOCA Centre that there's a real holistic view of the role that education plays. So, for example, the last event that IPRT engaged with in person in real life in the DOCA Centre was a, an a, a, an event organised by education with help on uh, period poverty. I mean, it was just in, in, an incredible event, informative, the role of supporting people's health generally uh, through the, the engagement of education. So I think DOCUS, we've got lots to learn also in the community about joint up thinking and uh, DOCUS is a good model in that regard. So all I can do now is, is thank all the, this was great. I knew the Q&A wouldn't be long enough no matter what. So thanks so much to Maria Gautam and to Maggie and thanks Kieran again for making this the focus of the NDA uh, annual conference this year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you.
Can you see those two two chats that kind of come in there? Uh, no. I saw them coming in, but they're, they're not. Oh, let's switch camera. Uh, um, no, Cormac um, or Lane, are you able to just use the Q&A function for this option? Those two, two chats that kind of come in there? Uh, no. I saw them coming in, but they're, they're not. Oh, let's switch camera. Uh, um, no, Cormac um, or Lane, are you able to get the feedback there? Can I function for this option? Liam, it's Elaine here. Um, so to just use the Q&A function, do we just paste in there as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it now and it doesn't seem to actually have an input box. Yeah. So, Fergal, um, I'm just trying to think now. What device are you on, Fergal? I'm, I'm actually on an iPad, which may okay. be a problem. Um, let me see now. How can we... Hi, Fergal. Cormac here. Uh, on the bottom of the video screen of your iPad, you should see some options. Exactly, yeah. Participants, share screen, Q and A, etc. You might see one with three. I see, no, I see Q and A at the top. Yeah. Can yeah, you put exactly, yeah, yeah. word more underneath? Uh, no. Switch to gallery. Switch camera. No. So across the top, there's leave, Zoom, Q and A, mute, stop video, share content, participants, and then there's a more. Sorry, there's a more. But let me just mention more. Uh, Webinar chat, there's a chat, sorry, chat here. Let me go into this. Open up 